Bienvenue à la session scientifique du département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa. La session se veut bilingue. Vous êtes invité à poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Bonne session. Cette présentation sera enregistrée et est disponible sur la chaîne YouTube du département de médecine familiale. En poursuivant la session, vous consentez à être enregistré si votre caméra ou microphone est activé. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Department of Family Medicine YouTube channel. By continuing the session, you are consenting to be recorded if your camera or microphone is activated. Nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui à partir de nombreux endroits différents et dans un espace virtuel. Mais nous désirons commencer par reconnaître les terres sur lesquelles se trouve le département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa, qui font partie du territoire traditionnel non cédé du peuple Anishinaabe algonquin. Nous vous invitons à réfléchir à votre propre emplacement au Canada par rapport au territoire où vous vous trouvez aujourd'hui. Nous reconnaissons aussi les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels, jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. Akonongum egawi kad ki migwewaj. Nimanajianig kakina anishnabeg undaje kaye ugug kakina eneagizijig ene kukamikak kanadang eje udapinagig endawajin udawang. We are gathered today from many different locations and in a virtual space but we wish to begin by recognizing the land on which the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa is located, which is part of the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. We invite you to think about your own location in Canada in relation to the territory where you find yourself today. We also acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders past, present and future. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the October edition of Family Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Doug Archibald. I'm the Director of Research for the Department of Family Medicine. And it's my uh, distinct pleasure this morning uh, to introduce um, our two speakers, um, Dr. Parisa Razaifar and Dr. Daniel Mirren. Um, I'll first off, uh, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Razaifar. Um, she is a mother of two and a family physician with a focused practice in sexual and reproductive health and an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa. Dr. Rezaifar's interest in health professions education focuses on simulation and technology to teach and evaluate competence in gynecologic procedures in primary care. Her leadership and advocacy interests focus on promoting equitable and inclusive health professions education. She's the co-director of the Equitable Leadership Network at the University of Ottawa. So Parisa, I will now hand things over to you. Thanks for inviting me to share with you uh, the findings of our uh, study, uh, which looked at a uh, the cross-sectional survey of academic family physicians' provision of office-based gynecologic uh, procedures. Um, thank you for acknowledging the land, and I want to just thank uh, all Indigenous people who have welcomed me. Uh, on this land at any um, place that I've been and any encounter that I've had with them as a recent settler. I have no conflict of interest and neither are, uh, do any of my collaborators. Um, the findings that I will be presenting to you today was uh, funded by a prime grant uh, from our department. And uh, I do have a new innovator award from the department to develop a blended uh, learning uh, curriculum to teach uh, uh, the gynecologic procedures in primary care. The mandatory office-based gynecologic uh, procedures were updated in 2021 by the College of Family Physicians of Canada, and they include a pap smear for the detection of uh, precancerous uh, cervical uh, uh, precancerous lesions of the cervix, 
intrauterine device insertion for uh, long-term reversible contraception, endometrial biopsy for the detection of endometrial cancer and distinguishing it from the non-cancerous uh, conditions that uh, cause abnormal uterine bleed. And in 2021, the vaginal pest refitting and routine care was added in response to the fact that 50% uh, of Paris women would experience uh, uh, pelvic organ prolapse or stress urinary incontinence in their uh, life, and pessaries are the first line conservative management uh, for these conditions. We know that these procedures are essential primary care services and lack of access to these uh, procedures increases health inequity and has adverse and, um, health and economic consequences for those uh, who were assigned female at birth. In Canada, the latest data we have is from 2004, and 77% uh, of family doctors at the time reported performing pap smear, 35% IUD, and a meager 15% provided endometrial biopsy. And we know that a three months delay in diagnosis of endometrial cancer has significant consequence on five-year survival. While we don't have recent data from Canada, we have recent data from the US. And despite their three-year residency program, their numbers are not much better than uh, ours according to the 2018. So of course their education is always uh, to blame. Um, there's been reported uh, limited training and lack of uh, opportunities to practice short training program, work hour limitations, and large number of procedures to master for our residents. And perhaps that's why uh, we're considering a third year uh, residency for our uh, trainees. So on my part, of course, given uh, this uh, gap in the education, um, I uh, have been fortunate to have this uh, innovation award to develop a curriculum uh, that is a blended curriculum to deliver the teaching of uh, these uh, procedures. And uh, using the current cycle, which I'm showing you, I want to orient you in terms of where we are and why this study was done. Um, when we develop a curriculum, um, we need a targeted needs identification uh, so that we know uh, what our stakeholders actually need. And what's beautiful about the current cycle is that you could actually develop um, different elements simultaneously, uh, which we've been doing. So we have been developing our educational strategies, uh, the evaluation and feedback um, tools and assessment tools all simultaneously. And what I'm going to show you today is the targeted needs identification that was needed to complete this uh, curriculum. So, of course, my journey started uh, several years ago in um, for uh, these procedures. This is actually from 2014, where I conducted a survey of our uh, residents asking them whether or not they felt they experienced adequate exposure to these procedures in their primary preceptor clinic versus gynae. And as you can see, um, uh, for pap smear, there was very little concern. Uh, however, when uh, we looked at the IUD insertion, endometrial biopsy, and pessary, the numbers kept on uh, dropping. And you're going to see a similar trend across the board throughout this uh, presentation. This is our 2021-2023 confidence survey from our own uh, residents, our own department, most recent data that we have. And um, while we don't look at pessary, unfortunately, on the um, on our survey, you can see that uh, the trend for pap smear, for endometrial biopsy and IUD. And as you can see, there's very little uh, difference we make in their training um, up until they get to the PGY3, if, uh, if uh, we, you can follow this trend essentially. What about our faculty? So we teach most of the formal curriculum, but we also provide a clinical setting for our residents to practice and we coach them. 
And there is good evidence that our practice pattern, our knowledge, skills, and attitude shape the way they will practice. Yet there's very little known about the practice pattern of academic family physicians uh, in provision of gynecologic procedures. So that was the goal of our study. We wanted to have a snapshot of provision of these procedures by academic family physicians. Then COVID hit and COVID the state. So we added one more question to see whether or not COVID changed their practice pattern. And we wanted to identify as many barriers as possible so that when we're developing our curriculum, we can address them. We chose to add punch biopsy of vulva to these procedures because while punch biopsy of the skin is a mandatory skill and many physicians offer it, when it comes to the vulva skin, um, in my 20 years of practice, I can count the number of uh, physicians who provide this procedure in one hand. And this is important because 20% of women experience a vulva condition in their life, and the punch biopsy is the diagnostic tool to distinguish certain inflammatory conditions from vulva cancer and expedites their management. So I wanted to understand what are the barriers and what kind of capacity we have so that when I develop the curriculum, I can ad address them. This was a cross-sectional survey. And uh, two of our residents, actually the twin Gerbers, uh, I think both of them were from the Civic or maybe one from Civic, one from Primrose, um, worked on developing the, uh, the uh, survey and uh, validating it. Uh, they used uh, the, um, the search, they conducted the search, uh, they identified all the barriers, they conducted some interviews with uh, expert academic family docs, focus groups, and they did the pilot testing of the survey. At the end, we had 14 questions on our survey. The first question was designed to exclude those academic family docs who practice uh, less than one day a week. Um, and then one question asked uh, about their comfort level in performing the procedures. One was about um, the frequency at which they offered the procedure um, in a typical year before and then during COVID. And then um, we wanted to know if they don't perform the procedure, who do they delegate the procedure to? Who do they refer to? And uh, lastly, we had one question with 18 barriers uh, of which they could choose uh, one or all. And uh, it addressed the domains of knowledge, skills, attitude, and systemic barriers. And then we asked some demographic questions. Uh, Dr. Steele and Ms. Kim Boban helped us uh, distribute the survey to uh, postgrad directors at 17 institutions, and then they decided whether or not they wanted to send the survey to their AFPs. We use descriptive statistics and bivariate associations using Fisher exact test um, to analyze the data, and we didn't modify any variables or weighting of any items. So this is our demographics. Um, two thirds of our respondents were female, and uh, the majority of our respondents were from University of Ottawa and Dalhousie. And as you can see, about one third, 30 percent of our respondents had completed a third year in uh, residency, which is very typical um, national average. Of those, half of them had completed women's health and low risk obstetrics. And then um, half of our respondents uh, practice in urban, suburban and pract uh, group practice, very similar to what you would expect in academic settings. So uh, here are results. Uh, so the first question was um, whether or not they performed these procedures. And as you can see, 97% of our respondents performed pap smear. Remember the national average we showed you earlier was about 77%. 68% offered uh, IUT. And the numbers started dropping once we hit the endometrial biopsy. So 55%. 
uh, endometrial biopsy, 30% routine pessary care, 16% uh, punch biopsy of vulva, and a meager 6% uh, pessary fitting. And then when we asked about their comfort level, as uh, you can see, it literally mirrors um, their offering of these uh, procedures, which is again, very consistent with literature. If you feel comfortable doing something, you're more likely to provide the care. Uh, this is uh, the results from what are, um, how COVID impacted their practice. And as you can see, 44% of respondents um, uh, said that they had uh, significantly reduced or stopped altogether uh, offering pap smear during COVID. For everything else, uh, about 20% of our respondents said that they had reduced or stopped altogether performing uh, the procedures, which is quite concerning. When it came to the barriers to provision of the care, uh, this is a very busy slide, so I'm going to try to uh, highlight the um, most um, frequently cited uh, barriers, which were um, lack of knowledge, lack of procedural skills, and lack of patient volumes to maintain competence. And as you can see, that was important for pet refitting and vulva biopsy, which doesn't pan out because given that the prevalence is 50% for pelvic organ prolapse and 20% for vulva concern, the question is whether or not when we see patients in 15 minutes and we have on the average um, about 3.7 um, concerns that we address, whether or not we prioritize uh, these gynecological concerns, especially given that both uh, pelvic organ prolapse, uh, incontinence, and vulva concerns carry quite a bit of shame uh, for patients. There was one more interesting, uh, highly cited um, barrier or a facilitator in a way that uh, they said that they had easy access to providers who perform these procedures, which unfortunately we know is no longer the case. The wait time to see a gynecologist in 2014 was about nine weeks. In 2022, it was published as 16 weeks, and we all know that these numbers are significantly increased right now with high rejection rate of these referrals from OBGYN. There was no other barriers that really stood out uh, in a way. Um, who do they refer these procedures? As you can see, PAP, uh, only uh, a few send them to nurses and nurse practitioners. When it came to the IUD insertion, the majority of referrals actually ended up in the hands of other family doctors, whether office mates or those uh, practicing in, in group practice uh, who do um, women's health. Everything else went to OBGYN. And again, this is quite concerning with the change in our wait time to see OBGYN. It's important for the access to these cares for our patients. This shows a bivariate association between OBGPs performed by our general AFPs versus the ones who completed a PGY3. And as you can see, there was no significant, uh, no statistically significant difference in um, offering these procedures, whether or not you completed a third year residency. However, when we broke down the PGY3s and looked at the ones who completed the women's health and low risk obstetrics versus other PGY3, we saw some difference. As you can see, the statistically significant numbers correlated to the IUD offering and endometrial biopsy only. There was no difference for uh, vulva biopsy, pest refitting, or routine care. Not too many people offered it regardless of completing a PGY3. While we can't com uh, compare the um, general AFPs with the PGY3 in women's health and low risk obstetrics. I'm using this graph to just show you the trend. The trend shows 
that the majority of people, regardless of PGY3, do the pap smear. This number unfortunately drops for IUD for general AFPs to 67% and 53% for endometrial biopsy, but it makes no difference whether or not you do a PGY3. Pretty much no one offers these uh, three other procedures. So what are the implications here? Of course, um, we first showed that AFPs actually offer um, pap smear more than the national average had uh, showed us in the past. Same thing for the uh, IUD and endometrial biopsies. AFPs offer uh, a higher percentage of AFPs offer IUD and endometrial biopsy. And doing a CAC in women's health um, showed that they offer IUD and endometrial biopsy uh, more. And we showed we we're the first study who's actually examined uh, the provision of care uh, by AFPs um, when it comes to pessary and punch biopsy of vulva in Canada. And we're showing a huge lack of resources for provision of these two procedures. And finally, we show the pervasive impact of uh, COVID-19 pandemic on uh, provision of these procedures. So when it comes to access to patient, uh, for patient care, uh, perhaps when we uh, have a centralized referral system, which I'm very optimistic we will have in Ontario, uh, we want to consider including the CACs um, and the AFPs who offer these procedures in the centralized referral system so that we can triage uh, these procedures to the ones who know it and keep the, um, say, endometrial biopsy and vulva biopsy for the gynecologists or those few CACs who actually offer them. Um, and then when it comes to the educational gap, this is important because clearly we have to train our AFP simultaneously with our residents um, through innovative um, uh, strategies, which brings us to our educational strategy, which is the innovation portal. Um, so using the innovation portal as a faculty member, you can access all the e-learning modules, but what's more, you could also have your assessment tools um, to provide the specific feedback or even cheat for yourself to remind yourself what are the steps to completing a pap smear, uh, sorry, a, an endometrial biopsy or a vulva biopsy. So it becomes almost a um, point of care, um, continuing professional development for you. So we're very fortunate that our department has supported us to have the innovation portal. And so far we've had um, three of our modules are ready to go and the last one will be done by the end of this year. And then again, we're so excited to, uh, to announce that we have residents who have stepped in to uh, create the modules for uh, the implant, uh, as well as the uh, medical termination. So they're all going to be housed in the um, portal. And with that, essentially all elements of the curriculum that uh, I had the Innovation Award for um, are coming to an end. And we will be uh, hopefully ready to implement uh, this by uh, July 1st, uh, 2024. Of course, our study has several limitations. Uh, we weren't able to uh, calculate response rate because uh, Postgrad directors did not share with us the, uh, the number of their AFPs, uh, but studies have shown that response rate may not strongly correlate with survey quality and its representativeness. Uh, but we certainly had uh, issues with power because of the small numbers and our uh, large academic um, centers, of course, don't reflect what's happening in our smaller community and rural centers. And again, I want to thank uh, everyone who helped with uh, this uh, project. Thank you so much. That was um, a, a great presentation. A tremendous amount of work went into this, both into the study and, of course, into the development of the e-learning as well. So um, congratulations. Um, 
very topical, right? Uh, you know, especially as we, we have the outcomes of training project and emphasis uh, on women's health and, uh, and procedures as well. So uh, thank you. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, Claire, I saw your question about payment method. So interestingly, payment method did not at all uh, get um, uh, get much attention, uh, perhaps because we are in um, uh, right. This our setting is such that um, uh, we are uh, capitation, and if anything, actually doing procedures is quite lucrative when you're in full um, because you get your uh, your bonuses. Uh, so that was not an issue, but I can imagine if you're a solo practitioner, uh, that would be certainly an issue. And certainly uh, the study from Kingston in uh, 2016, I believe, uh, did show that the payment method mattered for, uh, they looked at endometrial biopsy only, and it did matter. I'll jump in. I thought it was really interesting. Um, again, the third year training and the results mm -hmm. that you were showing on that. Um, so I guess I was expecting, I wasn't expecting to see such a difference, uh, given it was so focused. Um, so again, it sort of comes back in my mind with my chair of family medicine hat on is about the curriculum. And yeah. um, are yeah. we actually targeting the right things? And then the other piece, and I guess the payment model piece also leads into you know, what is the practice model that then mm -hmm. folks who do their focus training can actually go, go into? And in women's health, anecdotally, what I've heard is that, you know, it's it, it can be difficult. We know it's difficult to join uh, team-based practice anyways right now. It still mm -hmm. is. Um, and so maybe there's a disincentive and you don't end up being able to, to land in a team-based practice model, which would then be supporting you to do these this type of procedures. Um, and I think that's yeah. something that, that we can look at for the future. So. so, Claire, I think this is really important because essentially it's showing us that if we don't have faculty who does pastry or punch mm -hmm. biopsy of vulva, doesn't matter if we add a third year. Yeah. Right? This is, this is evidence that it doesn't matter how long you're sticking around. If you don't see anybody doing it, including your, uh, your uh, mentors in women's health they're not doing yeah. it or they're not going to do it thanks so much uh Teresa. well done so um let's now move to our uh second presenter um dr daniel mirren uh dr mirren is a public health and family medicine physician and researcher his program of research involves using health administrative data to examine the burden of societal impact of mental health conditions and substance use his current focus is tracking the mental health of physicians in Ontario and examining the health impacts of changes in alcohol and cannabis policies and their influence on health inequities. Um, Daniel is a new um, uh, member of our uh, department, and he's also an investigator at the uh, Briere Research Institute. And um, I know this hasn't, we haven't officially announced this yet, but uh, I also want to say that um, Daniel is uh, a new recipient of the, uh, of a uh, tier two Canada research chair in uh, social accountability. And to say that he is the first family physician in our department to receive such an award. So big congratulations, Daniel, and uh, look very much forward to hearing what you have to say today. Well, thanks a lot. I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, a novel uh, use of data, so health administrative data, and to basically the, the idea of this project is how do you use a, a new approach uh, to look at physician mental health, uh, and, with, and obviously it has implications too for physician health in general. Uh, and the focus today is going to be uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but I think that this is work that that will and can continue to look at a variety of different things. Uh, so a couple of acknowledgements, uh, very grateful for funding from uh, the DFM, uh, from the Briere Research Institute uh, through CIHR, and there's uh, been a salary support and an operating grant. And other than that, I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, so as a background, I, you know, I think everyone on the call is aware that there's been a, a long interest in the mental health challenges of physicians and burnout. Uh, and this was something that was gaining a lot of 
uh, emphasis and discussion pre-pandemic. And then uh, I think the pandemic, you know, really put a lens to this and there was much further discussions of it. Uh, there was a big concern that physician mental health would get worse during the pandemic. Uh, and most of the data to date has come from surveys. Uh, and the surveys are uh, primarily cross-sectional uh, and a lot of them have low response rates. So, you know, you get a survey from the OMA saying that there's really high levels of burnout uh, one year into the pandemic, but the response rate is 6%. Uh, and you don't have a good baseline of, you know, and the OMA may have a, a prior burnout survey, but it also had a response rate of 6%. And you're kind of left with trying to guess whether it's actually worse or not. Uh, and our view was that this was a really good opportunity to use big data uh, to look at this in a different way. And we're going to study physicians as patients. So what we did, uh, and this was done by uh, Peter Tani Saputro and Manish Sood, uh, but they linked uh, the CPSO registry uh, to the health and min data at ICS. So it, it's basically grabbing every physician who registered to practice in the CPSO starting in 1990. 86% uh, of them were successfully linked into ICS. Uh, and what we're gonna do in two studies that I'm gonna talk about is look at changes in mental health visits in physicians in the pre-pandemic compared to the pandemic period. Uh, and we're, we're defining these visits using a variety of diagnostic and billing codes. Uh, so the first study that I wanna talk about uh, was called Physician Healthcare Visits for Mental Health and Substance Use During the COVID-19 Pandemic in Ontario, Canada. Uh, we published this in 2000, early 2022. Uh, and what we said was, is, you know, where everyone's concerned about the mental health of physicians, let's find out if outpatient mental health visits by physicians have changed during the pandemic. And then let's look if there's different groups of physicians by specialty, age, sex, uh, you know, work with COVID-19 patients who may have had differences in that change. Uh, so we linked, uh, we ended up linking 34,000 physicians. Uh, we tracked them for the three years before the pandemic and in the first year of the pandemic. Uh, and the second study I'm going to talk about ends up with more physicians because we had a, a slightly different cohort. Uh, and then we looked at age, sex, specialty, uh, prior mental health, and COVID-19 exposure. Uh, so here's, here's the cohort. I think there's some really interesting things going on that I just want to emphasize pre-pandemic. To me, the pandemic story is an interesting story, but I actually think that the, the long-term value of this research is to start saying this is a novel way to look at physician health and to track different types of policies on it. Uh, but, you know, 17.4% uh, of physicians in Ontario have seen a psychiatrist or a family physician for, a for an outpatient mental health reason at any given time in the past year. That was pre-pandemic, uh, which I think is a really interesting statistic and kind of goes towards the idea that this is maybe more common. I, well, maybe we'll have some insights after if this is more common or less common than what people thought it would be. Uh, I'll emphasize a couple of things. So female physicians have a much higher rate of mental health visits than male physicians. Uh, one of the nuances of our cohort is because it's an incidence cohort, people join from 1990 onwards, it's very young. Uh, so people who registered to practice before 1990 are not in this cohort. So you'll see that actually 78% of the physicians uh, in the cohort or 78% of the visits, this is the wrong table for the number, but I, I think it's 60% or so or less than 50, which is of course not the demographic break at, breakdown of all physicians in Ontario. Uh, and then as across really interesting patterns by specialty, uh, people are probably not surprised. So psychiatry, enormous rates of mental health visits. So they're at uh, 3,441 uh, 3, per thousand physicians in the year before the pandemic. Uh, family medicine, 687. Surgeons not really showing up for outpatient mental health and substance use concerns. Uh, anesthesia as well. Uh, so some 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 wide variation by specialty, and we can and there's something special that's probably happening with psychiatry. Uh, but I do think that I you, one should not look at this data and go the surgeons are doing really well. Their mental health is pristine. Uh, I think this is revealing large differences in stigma across different specialties and care seeking behavior. Uh, here's what happened during the pandemic. So this is from an ARIMA model, uh, which deals with the, the high rate of seasonality and changes over time. But just to explain it to you, so we start in March of 2017, we go towards March of 2021, so the first year. Uh, we're, this is every two weeks, the, the rate of outpatient physician mental health and substance use visits. Uh, and the black is basically what the model is saying. It, that's what the model is fitting pre-pandemic. 
And then that's what it's projecting would have happened after the pandemic if there had been no pandemic. And then the orange dots are what we actually observed. And what you see is the model's doing a pretty good job. So it's predicting well pre-pandemic. It predicts that things would have just continued normally and visits in fact went up quite a bit. Uh, and if you sum it up, they're up by 27% in physicians during the pandemic. You know, there's some interesting things. Physicians, this, these, these large drops that you see is the probably the closure of outpatient mental health uh, services or their large reduction over the, the December holidays that happened, but really just a universal increase across the pandemic. Uh, what are people visiting for? Uh, so, and, and how did that change during the pandemic? So first of all, uh, these are all your outpatient codes when you're coding visits for people in your EMR, this is going someplace, this is actually going into ICS and people are using it. We can have discussions about how how accurate these are. You know, many people use a depression or an anxiety code as a bit of a catch-all for mental health concerns. So I would interpret this with a huge grain of salt. But most physicians, so 66% pre-COVID and 69% during COVID, are coming in for reasons related for an anxiety code, essentially. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit interesting that codes for adjustment reaction go up 42%, so 3.5 to 4.1%. But really, the takeaway is it's mostly anxiety. Uh, there's some codes for drug, drug and alcohol use. Those actually declined during the pandemic. Uh, and, but, but really, it's, it's an outpatient anxiety problem is what's being captured. Uh, this is a quick graph. One of the questions that you might have is, did physician or physician mental health visits up uh, because mental health visits are up or because all types of physician visits are up? And so rather than looking at the rate of mental health visits per physician, we're now looking at the rate of mental health visits in physicians versus health visits in physicians. So an outpatient visit to a family doctor for hypertension or to a gastroenterologist for uh, bleeding, whatever it was. Uh, and what we see is that, again, at the start of the pandemic, mental health visits increased much faster than other types of visits. And then they actually equalized by the end of the pandemic. So you kind of have no increase in the proportion of visits and physicians that are for mental health. And the way I interpret this is that there's been a big uptick in mental health visits of 27% by physicians at the start of the pandemic there was no corresponding increase in other types of health visits. Physicians didn't have an increase for hypertension visits or for management of other conditions. But as the pandemic progressed, you actually did have an increase in outpatient visits for other causes. Uh, and the interpretation of that is interesting too, and we'll discuss it briefly. Uh, and then let's, if we, if we dive down by subgroup, so these are incidence rate ratios, we're looking at changes by physician, uh, and, you know, so did the visit changes by uh, males and females differ? And maybe female visits went up slightly more than males, but there, there wasn't a significant difference. Same thing by age. You'll notice that there's enormous confidence intervals on some of these, like rurality. Uh, no real urban-rural differences. Interestingly, no difference by whether you treated COVID patients. Uh, so if you treated zero COVID patients during the course of the pandemic, and we did this by billing codes, and it's not fully uh, precise, but again, people who were not working in acute care settings with uh, patients who were positive for COVID-19 had a similar mental health change to people who were, who did, you know, what we arbitrarily defined as medium volume and high volume. Uh, the only subgroup difference that we saw that was interesting is that physicians who had no past mental health history were much more likely to have an increase in the pandemic than physicians without. Uh, so again, you have that this increase in physician mental health visits is actually being driven by physicians who've never sought care for mental health or never recently sought care for mental health uh, increasing during the pandemic. Uh, so here's the takeaway from the first study. There's been a big increase in outpatient mental health visits and physicians during the pandemic. Uh, it was in, caused by an increase both in the number of physicians and their frequency of visits. Uh, and I look at this data, I'm, this, is, this is probably doing two things, but I think it truly is capturing worsening mental health in physicians. It's probably also capturing reduced barriers to accessing mental health services in physicians. Uh, and the question that we were left at the end of this study is, are this finding, is this 25% increase in visits, is that the risk of being a physician 
during a pandemic or is that the risk of living through a pandemic? Uh, so we're going to move on and we're going to see, hey, physician visits, mental health visits are up. What's happened to the general population in Ontario? Uh, so in our follow-up study, we, we did just that. We compared changes in mental health service use uh, by physicians during the pandemic to that of non-physicians. Uh, you'll notice, so now we've got 41,000 physicians instead of, I think, 35,000 in the first one. Uh, and that's because we were able to link physicians past 2018. So we got the physicians who became physicians in 2019, 20, and 21. Uh, and we're going to look at the first year and a half of the pandemic compared to the first year. And we'll compare to uh, 21 million people, uh, non-physicians living in Ontario. And we're going to look at uh, outpatient visits and emergency room visits and hospitalizations as well. Uh, so the we're going to look at three, three slides like this. They all look very similar. Uh, the red is the non-physicians. The blue is the physicians. And this is the pre-COVID-19 period. And then this line divides pre-COVID to COVID. And the dashed blue and the dashed red is showing what the historical visit pattern was in the, in the dark uh, color is what was actually observed. And we're here, we're looking at overall outpatient visits. This is to, to family physicians or psychiatry and, to, and uh, potentially to some nurse practitioners. Uh, what we see is that during the pandemic, uh, and again, the numbers have changed slightly because we have different time scales and a slightly different cohort of physicians, but there was a 23% increase in mental health visits by physicians compared to a 9.8% increase in non-physicians. And when you adjust for, and this is adjusted for age and sex, and when we you go on and you adjust for age and sex and income and rurality, it continues to be a significant difference. And again, here you notice that pre-pandemic, the physicians actually have a slightly higher rate of mental health visits than non-physicians. Now we're looking at psychiatry. Uh, I think the most striking finding here is the, the pre-pandemic differences. So physicians have a much, much higher rate of psychiatry visits than non-physicians. Uh, and again, we see that during the pandemic, physicians see a 21% increase in psychiatry visits compared to 6% in non-physicians. And then we flip over and we're looking at family medicine uh, visits. And again, family uh, physicians have a lower rate of outpatient mental health visits to a family physician than the general pop than the uh, than the general population. So more likely to see a psychiatrist, far less likely to see a family physician for a mental health concern. Uh, and again, a similar pattern where you see larger increases in physicians than in non physicians. Uh, this is. An interesting uh, virtual care phenomenon. I won't get into the details, but the takeaway is, is that this increase in physician mental health visits that's bigger than non-physicians is driven by huge uptake in virtual care in physicians compared to also a huge uptake in virtual care in non-physicians, but not as big. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. I think that I've put a couple slides that I think we may come to uh, to answer questions. So we'll come back to them if people want. Uh, but I do want to leave lots of time for, for people to, to ask questions. Uh, so I'll wrap up my thoughts on this paper as well. So I think COVID-19 was, again, associated with a much larger increase in physician mental health visits than non-physicians. And again, this raises concern that the COVID-19 impacts on mental health were specifically worse in physicians due to an occupational stressor. And we can speculate on what those might be. Uh, and it's probably also capturing greater physician sensitivity to changes in access to healthcare. Uh, and we saw that in the first study where kind of towards the, the second uh, six months of the first year of the pandemic, physicians started increasing all of their visits. So it could be that physicians really like virtual care, that for whatever reason in a busy clinician schedule, uh, for, for making time, for whatever it is, it's just much easier for physicians to access virtual care services than in person. Uh, I think the, uh, the other large implication is physicians had very different patterns of mental health service use than non-physicians before the pandemic. Uh, and as family physicians, we can talk about, you know, whether or not it's ideal that uh, physicians are basically getting most of their mental health services through psychiatry uh, and whether that makes sense from, you know, a medical home perspective and the benefits of, of having a, a family medicine home. And I think that as we look at this, you know, men, the, I think that there's more interventions that are needed 
And that's maybe the pandemic has exacerbated mental health in physicians, but obviously there's a long-standing burnout problem and mental health crisis amongst the physician population in Ontario and internationally. Uh, I'll plug a couple of opportunities for future work and other stuff that we're doing. Uh, not, not led by me, but a, a study I was very happy to be part of. Uh, we looked at primary care attachment for physicians and we found that it was 25% lower compared to non-physicians. So uh, physicians are just much more likely to actually have and see a family physician uh, than the general population in Ontario. And what we're looking at long, or what I'm leading uh, long-term or collaborating with other members of the DFM, including uh, Claire Kendall and uh, Courtney Maskreen, uh, is looking at uh, long-term trends in the mental health visit. So we're going to go back all the way to 2003 and say, you know, how how is the mental health service use of medical students, residents, and people in their first five years of practice changed over time? And we'll dive into specialties as well. Uh, and then we're very interested in understanding what are some of the, the predictors of people specializing in family medicine and then delivering comprehensive care. Uh, big thanks to lots of collaborators. I will leave this up uh, and uh, right there. I But I, I welcome anyone's questions right now. I, I think there's lots and lots to unpack and discuss. And uh, maybe the last thing that I'll say before questions is that uh, it's, it's, it's an open collaborative. So if people are looking at this and going, how cool that you've linked uh, the CPSO data, I have some fun ideas. Uh, please do get in touch because we're we're happy to to welcome other investigators and and come up with projects. Daniel, thank you so much. Those were two great presentations of um, uh, of your recent studies. Um, and I thought you did a particularly good job in um in in, in dis describing the results, um you know, the figures that you had put up. So thank you very much for that. Um, let's move on to questions. I see Kumanan, you've got a hand up. Yeah, thanks, Dan. That was really interesting. So I had a couple of questions. One is, are physicians getting, is the reason physicians are getting more care because they had better access to care? And did the general population perhaps not have that access? I know that was a problem during the pandemic. Um, the second question was, when you go to your difference in specialties, pre-pandemic, did you adjust that for sex and gender? Uh, was there an adjustment that could show that those differences persisted after that adjustment? Yeah, so so I think two excellent questions. So the first one, I think there is undoubtedly the case that physicians have streamlined access to mental health services and that that occurred in the pandemic as well. And you see that for the psychiatry, right? You see a very small increase in psychiatry. You see a much larger increase in physician services to psychiatrists than you see to uh, than you see in the general population. And I think that's because a physician who presents in crisis very rapidly can see a psychiatrist. And, and that's a good thing that, you know, no one should be discounting that. I think I, so I think it's contributing. I don't think it's the full story again, because you see the difference, you see a, a, a difference as well for family practice. And again, you know, I was, I was working walk-in clinics during uh, in urgent care during the pandemic. And, you know, it felt like everyone coming in was there for mental health reasons. So I think that there was you know, there was ongoing access to mental health services and physicians do and maybe had increased uh, access to mental health services. But the I think the general population to primary care access and urgent care access continued during the pandemic where people could be seen. Uh, for the second one, we did adjust for, uh, for age and sex. Uh, you can't adjust with, for much more because of what you have within ICS, but those differences persisted. And again, if we look at psychiatry, I think, you know, the reason I, I think that, you know, there, it may be that psychiatrists have uh, different mental health profiles than other types of physicians, but there's also a, a practice in psychiatry of seeing another psychiatrist for counseling and discussion. Uh, and that's encouraged during residency and during practice. So I think part of the pattern that you see there is that psychiatrists who may or may not have a, a mental health disorder are seeing a psychiatrist, which is recommended within the, the practice community just for kind of uh, mental health, uh, care, and wellness, and check-ins. Parisa, um, Daniel, great study, uh, great work. Um, patterns seem very similar to uh, those found with the team I was working uh, with on cardiovascular care, where when they compared physicians to the general population, 
much lower rates of seeing primary care at lower cardiovascular risk factors, so lower baseline risk, uh, lower visits to primary care, and higher rates of visits direct to specialists. And we sort of thought, is this like the corridor consult effect? For those who are in the hospitals, they, they just see their quick colleague and say, you know, I've got X, and boom, they go straight to specialists. Um, but it was a very similar pattern that physicians tend to go direct to specialists rather than have that sort of comprehensive preventive care, uh, primary care visit with the good and the bad that that involves. Uh, so similar patterns, not just for mental health, but for all care. Yeah, thanks. I, I So I think that that's what we're going to see pretty universally, that physicians are going to, and, you know, and I think the reasons for that are, are we probably don't have time to get into, but very fun to speculate on what they could be. But I, I echo that. I, and again, that that study that was uh, that was looking at primary care attachment for family docs or for uh, two family docs by physicians, uh, the follow up work is that they have much higher rates to specialists uh, that are there. So I think I think we'll see it pretty universally across specialty care. So that might negate my suspicion uh, because I was actually wondering if um, you had the ability to look at for physicians uh, coverage for these services. I remember a few years ago with OMA negotiation, one of the things that um, was uh, advertised, the fact that uh, physicians uh, don't have extended health benefits. Um, and so if you don't have extended health benefit and you're not married to a public servant with a handsome um, benefit, uh, you actually, your only way to receive uh, counseling is through psychiatry. And, um, you know, again, in my 20 years practice, I remember that's what was the barrier for my patients who didn't have health benefits. Then I would send them to a psychiatrist for at least a meager uh, appointment, a few visits for some sort of a counseling. So I don't know if you have the capacity to actually look for their ability to access extended health benefits and coverage. Yeah, it's it's an excellent uh, it's an excellent like area of the limitation of the health admin data. Right, we have no access to psychologists and other types of counselors. And again, one of the biases that you can raise is that during the pandemic you have a bunch of physician wellness programs that jump up. Uh, and could it be that the we're underestimating the changes in physicians because you had uh, a lot of people moving into uh, some, you know, hospital specific or clinic specific physician wellness services that are getting counseling not captured within OHIP. Uh, and it is, and again, you know, not, uh, I think that one of the conclusions that our team is coming to is that for much of the physician health work, you do need a mixed methods approach. Uh, where the core idea is that you're using this health admin data to do new and innovative stuff, but you're figuring out what your gaps are with surveys or other types or, or you know, qualitative approaches, uh, and you're complementing what the health what the health admin data doesn't have. Yeah, thank you. I want to just congratulate Parisa and Dan on their tremendous work. Um, really great to see. And I wanted to highlight, though, that they both did receive some salary support and support through <clears throat> grants. Um, uh, from the Department of Family Medicine, there are more opportunities available for, for folks uh, to really also start from the ground up. So please um, take a look at uh, the funding that we have put aside. We just increased the amount and there's a half a million dollars that's been put aside for the next three years, I think, Doug, to support um, academic and scholarly work. Uh, we embrace, and as you can see with Parisa's work, uh, innovations in medical education. There's so many gaps. So please um, think about your areas where you see problems um, and uh, don't be afraid to start taking those first steps. So uh, thank you so much. And like fantastic work, Parisa, and uh, really uh, fantastic work, Dan.